Hey, good morning, everybody. I don't know if you uh, heard about this or not, but over in the northeast part of London, in England, uh, last Sunday, uh, a couple was in their apartment or house, maybe it was, and, and they were trying to foretell the future uh, with a crystal ball. And you can kind of see it there in the, in the bottom of the picture at the bottom and uh, uh, the screen. And, and uh, I, I guess it wasn't working too well because they couldn't foretell that their house was going to burn down when they left it sitting in the sun. And, and uh, a fire started because of it. You, you know, I, I'm not really good at prediction. Uh, you know, predictions or predicting the future uh, outside of the Word of God. But I can guarantee you that what's in the Word of God predicts what's coming on the world and what's going to happen in the future. I want to give you a prediction today of something that's going to happen. And well, you, you know, it, it may not be kind of one of those uh, uh, really fun things that, that you have to think about, but it's something that you have to consider. If you're a Christian um, and, and you know that uh, your destination is heaven, you know that there's going to be opposition in the world around you, and so you've got to begin to uh, face that reality that you cannot get along with everyone. That's going to be in our text today in John chapter 7. We're going to be uh, uh, looking at what Jesus said is going on in the world around us. In John chapter 7, if you would, open your Bibles this morning, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight or prediction into some stuff that's coming into your future. If you're a brand new Christian, well, you probably needed to know this information maybe beforehand, but even so, uh, it's still something that's going to happen uh, whether you like it or not. And so Jesus gives us a, a great insight into stuff that's going on in the world around us. John chapter 7, and we're just going to try and read the whole chapter here today. There's a lot, a lot of stuff uh, in here, a lot of different ways, you know, we could go uh, uh, with this text today, but we're going to kind of stick to this one theme, and, and the reason for that is, is because I think people need to know uh, what's going on in their own personal lives and what's going on in the lives of Christians all over the world. John chapter 7, starting in verse 1, he says, after this... It says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews were there waiting to take his life. Remember, I talked about a couple of weeks ago and, and the week before that, you know, about uh, the behind the scenes stuff that is going on. We see the, the forefront, you know, the, uh, of what's going on. But behind the scenes, uh, the Jews are building animosity against Jesus. This crescendo is continually building until we get to the time uh, when they finally arrest him and then crucify him. Verse 2, But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Hey, you know, you ought to leave here and go to Judea, so that your disciples may see the miracles that you're doing. No one who wants to be a, a public figure acts in secret. Since you were doing these things, why don't you show yourself to the world? For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore, Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come, but for you, any time is right. You know why he said that? Because they were so uh, going along with the things of the world uh, and the teachings of the Pharisees and the teachings of the Sadducees, and, and, and they didn't see the distinction between what Jesus was trying to tell them was truth in the world and the evil that was going on in the world around them. A lot of times today, we, it, we have the same thing. We don't see it either. But anyway... Um, verse uh, 6, he says, Therefore, it says, Therefore, Jesus told them, The right time for me has not yet come. Y you know, we know that God is building um, this plan, this kind of behind the scenes plan. Uh, if we think that all of a sudden, uh, one day the, the Jews just jumped up and, and got mad at Jesus and grabbed a hold of him and decided, oh, you know, he'd be a great guy to uh, kill for the Passover. Uh, well, we're mistaken. That's not what happened. And, and the Jews really uh, were only acting in accordance with God's plan. Go to the book of Acts and, and you can find that out for yourself. This was God's set purpose and foreknowledge. It wasn't the Jews' plan. God knew it was going to happen. He knew that Jesus, his son, was going to be the once and for all sacrifice. Okay, go to verse 10. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of skipped verse 7. We better back up there for a minute. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast yet because for me the right time has not yet come. 
Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went there as well, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and saying, where is that guy? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man, while others said, he deceives the people. But no one wanted to say anything publicly for fear of the Jews. You know, uh, we see this over and over again, uh, not, not only, uh, you know, in, in Christian lives, but in other lives that people don't want to stand up and say something about the right thing to do, even though they know what the right thing is to do, uh, because they're afraid of public opinion. And that's the same thing we saw happening here. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having even studied? And Jesus said to them, My teaching is not my own, for it comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak of my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. And there is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You're demon possessed, the crowd said. Who's trying to kill you? And Jesus answered them, I did one miracle and you're all astonished. Yet because G uh, Moses uh, gave you circumcision, though actually it didn't even come from him, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities concluded that he really is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Now these guys, you know, sometimes... You run into people in life that, that uh, uh, tell you what's going on in, in the world or talk to you about spiritual things, but really have no idea. You know, if these were Jews uh, that are standing here talking, then they obviously haven't read um, the Old Testament because multiple times, multiple places, it talks about uh, where Jesus was going to come from and who he was going to be, who's, uh, uh, how, what line he was going to come from. But we know where this man is from again. When the Christ comes, they said, nobody's going to know. Well, that just wasn't uh, the case. It wasn't true. Then Jesus, still uh, teaching in the temple courts, cried out in a loud voice, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one could lay a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Remember, as I said before, uh, the Pharisees and, and the people that uh, hate what Jesus is teaching and hate the things that he's doing are not the people who are in charge. They are not the ones who is orchestrating uh, what's going on. God is behind the scenes in charge and in control at all times. He always knows what's going on. Verse 31, still many in the crowd put their faith in him. And they said, when the Christ comes, is he going to do any more miracles than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Now you know that uh, Jesus has stepped on one too many toes. He's made these guys pretty mad. He's, he's got them to a, 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 a place where they're, they're ready to grab a hold of him and kill him. But this isn't where the Passover lamb was supposed to be sacrificed. Remember, he is in Galilee. He is not in Jerusalem at the temple. Verse 33, Jesus said to them when they got there, and you can imagine these guards, um, you know, with their swords in hand, and they come uh, uh, walking up to Jesus in this uh, uh, next uh, uh, verse here, and, and, and Jesus just looks at them, and he says something to them, 
and, uh, and all of a sudden they just stop in their tracks. And for the whole rest of this conversation that goes on, they're just stunned. They don't know what to do or what to say. That's what happens when you meet Jesus face to face. You're, you're just so blown away, you, you don't know what to do. It, listen to the, this. Listen to what he says to him. He says, I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You're going to look for me, but you will not find me, because where I'm going, you can't come. Ooh, I bet that kind of burnt. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And up until that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his word, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. But others said, no, I think he's the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived. Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests who asked them, where is he? Why didn't you bring him with? And they answered in reply and said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Are you kidding me? You mean he has deceived you too? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? Look at his answer. He gives his, his own answer here. He says no, but he doesn't know what's going on behind the scenes. He doesn't know about the guy coming up here in just a second. So he says no, but this mob, now he's talking about uh, 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 people that were uh, valuable to them a few days ago. Now he's calling them a mob that knows nothing of the law. It, uh, there is a curse on them. But Nicodemus, remember from uh, chapter 3, um, who had gone to see Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing them to find out what he is doing? And they replied, What are you from Galilee to? Look into it and you will see that no prophet comes out of Galilee. Then each of them returned to their own home. So here's my uh, prediction for you this morning. And... Uh, uh, I have my uh, crystal ball with me this morning, so to speak, and, and uh, I, I can tell you for sure, my crystal ball that talks about what is coming and what's going to happen uh, uh, in your life and in the world around you, the closer you get to God, uh, has never set my house on fire, not once, but it has set my heart on fire many times during the day, okay, each and every day. So here's my prediction. This is it. Well, the closer you get to Christ and the more that you get into His Word and study His Word, the more the world around you is going to hate you. That You're going to notice, uh, you're going to be able to see for yourself <clears throat> sin and evil in the world around you. The distinction is, be going, is going to become more clear to you. If you choose Christ, realize this, just as we just read in, in this, throughout this whole passage, is there is going to be division. Division is going to come because the ways of God are not the ways of man. And if we are not following Christ, we are following the ways of the world instead. Jesus said there's going to be division that's going to come. If, if you would, write this down. Uh, go study this because we're not going to go over there and, and read it. But I, I want you to read it to understand a little more in depth of what Jesus is trying to say about division. Because everybody says, you know, oh, uh, Jesus was just this uh, great guy that came and, and he taught everybody to peace and, uh, uh, and, and he taught them about love and living in harmony. That's not what he taught. Not at all. He said in a lot of statements, several different places, that there was going to be trouble and division between you as a Christian and the world. You can't walk in both places. We've talked about that before. So anyway, write this down, go home, look it up, study it out, and see what Jesus had to say about division coming uh, uh, into people's lives who follow Christ. Matthew chapter 10 
and read verse start at uh, about verse 34 and read all the way to the end of the chapter. So look at what happens in the text. Uh, one of the first things we see is in verse five. He says he's, it says that uh, his brothers didn't believe in him. When um, uh, you come to Christ, there's going to be an immediate division in the world around you. That is, uh, you as a Christ seeker, a Christ follower, and the rest of the world. The first one that is brought up here is his family from verse uh, uh, 5. It says that his brothers didn't even believe in him, his own family. Though he grew up among them, they couldn't see who he was. Why? Because he had not yet, at that time as a kid, been revealed to the world. Now we think of Jesus. What was Jesus doing when he was growing up? Oh, he's walking around and, and making all the crops come up real fast or, or uh, 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 building a chair really super quick or something like that. But that's not true at all. Jesus was not revealing himself other than at the age of 12 at the temple where he astonished, it says, the people with the amount of knowledge and the amount of teaching that he could do. So number one is there's going to be a division of family. Number two, it says in verse 43, that there's going to be a division between the people who follow Jesus and who don't. In other words, you're going to have a division uh, with your family members the closer you get to Christ, and you're going to have a division with the world around you, those who are not seeking Christ. You're going to grow apart from them, or you should be anyway. And if you're not, we're going to talk about that here in a minute, what's going on. So uh, uh, number three, there's a number three in here that's not quite as obvious, but we're going to talk about it nonetheless. And number three is you. And that you is, as you come closer to Christ, um, uh, you are going to be uh, uh, changed yourself. The old you, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, says, For if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the old is gone, and the new has come. In other words, you're going to be divided yourself, because you're going to begin to see uh, the things going on in the world around you, the evil in the world around you, and you're going to separate yourself uh, uh, from it the closer you come to Christ. So let's do this. Let's uh, first look at family and friends. And when we look at family and friends, um, you know, you got to ask this question, uh, who likes to be hated? Well, nobody does. I, you know... Nobody uh, walks around every day and says, boy, I hope I can find somebody that hates Christians to run into today and have an argument with them. Nobody does that. Nobody wants to be hated in the world around us. But we know that it's coming. We know that those things are going to happen. Contrary to people's uh, uh, deep down desire to be loved and to be needed and to be accepted by the world is what James said in James 4.4. 4. Listen to this. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? And anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Who wants to be an enemy of God? I would rather be an enemy of the world than an enemy of God. Because I know my eternal destination. I'm not worried about what the world thinks about me, but I am concerned about what God thinks about me. I'm not seeking man's approval, but I do seek God's approval. I want to live in his kingdom forever okay here's the next one number three hebrews 4 12 says um, that the word of god is living and active and it will divide who you are as you come closer to christ the things from your past the things that were not of god ungodly habits ungodly behavior ungodly language movies you watch books you read tv you watch music you listen to whatever it is should become distant from you if you're growing closer to Christ every day, the word divides uh, who you were from who uh, God wants you to be. The word becomes living and active inside of you. And the more clearly you can see then the world around you and the things that are going on. We were just talking about this Wednesday night, how so much of the world uh, thinks that the things that go on are not a problem. But we see a clear distinction between God's word and what God says and what the world is doing around us. Here's one we talked about uh, Wednesday night at our Bible study is we're looking at uh, cultural influences on Wednesday night and how culture, all the way from the Romans uh, up through the Middle Ages is where we uh, were uh, uh, Wednesday night and, and so on and how that culture uh, uh, back then has influenced what the church has become today. 
Some of it is pretty shocking, and, and you would be surprised to learn how far from the original church that we have become. And we need to get back there. We need to get back to the roots of who we are. Now, here's one of the things we talked about um, Wednesday night uh, uh, that, that we see so prevalent in the world, and this is an obvious one. Some aren't so obvious, but this one is. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, Man shall not lie with man as he lies with the woman. And it says, goes on in the, the end of the verse, says, if, if they do, they should be taken out and killed. Now, people in the world around us today think, oh, that's no big deal. But it is a big deal. If it's a big deal to God, it's a big deal to me as a Christian, as a follower. And it should be a big deal to you too. We can't just sit back and say, Oh, that's no big deal because it, 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 uh, it isn't what I'm doing in my life. But we need to speak out against it. Remember Nicodemus. You know, Nicodemus knew who Jesus was, but he didn't really speak out about him, did he? He didn't really say. He kind of stayed in the background. And that's what a lot of Christians try and do. We want to ride that fence or, or, or not be in the limelight. But God has called us to take a stand. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But unfortunately, the gates of hell sometimes are. They're forcing the church indoors not to do anything. And God doesn't call us to do that. So in the contrast of that, of what God's Word said that I just read, uh, this last week in Texas, uh, a judge uh, overruled 76% of the population in Texas that voted that marriage is between a man and a woman. And he, one guy, he comes along and he says, oh, no, we're going to change that. We're not going to do it. We need to get rid of all of those judges, every single one of them. We need to kick them out, throw them out. And this is the division that comes in the world. And we've got to take a stand on which side we're going to be on. You can't be on both sides, okay? I want to say something here real quick to uh, the kids that are here today. And that is this. Um, you know, you have to make sure that you understand the distinction that I'm trying to say. Because even though uh, uh, people do stuff in the world around us that is contrary to God's Word, um, we, we, we are not to hate those people, okay? Do you understand? Uh, we're, we're to love those people, but hate the sin that they commit. Now, is that sin that they commit, you know, like what I just talked about, worse than other sin? No, God, God doesn't like lying. He doesn't like stealing. He doesn't like cheating. He doesn't like any of that kind of stuff. He wants us to be a, a holy people set apart people. But it doesn't mean we uh, begin to show hatred for the world around us. The Bible says uh, in Isaiah 118, a good example for you guys to follow is, uh, come let us reason together. We're not supposed to uh, go out and, and try and force people to our point of view, but we're supposed to reason with them and show them from the Word of God how the things that they're doing are contrary to God, how they have offended God, just like each one of us has and how we can make them right again with God. That's our, our, our duty. We are relationship builders. We are fence menders. I love to go out in the summertime and the spring and, and fix fences because it reminds me so much of, of ministry. I go out and I, I mend fences. You, you know, I, I fix uh, barbed wire fences that have been broke down, you know, from tumbleweeds and stuff in the wintertime. And, and, uh, and that's what I do with uh, your relationship with God. I'm trying to help you mend your relationship with God as I'm working on my own relationship with God. I'm trying to mend my own relationship because I've broken that by violating His holy law and His commands. And we've got to make sure that we express that to people, not in anger, not in hatred. Come, let us reason together, Isaiah 1 says. Okay? Let's move on. For some of these people and his family and friends, uh, you know, it wasn't until uh, after his death that they began to see who he was, that they began to understand what Jesus did and what he taught and the authority that he had. You, you know how it is, you know, sometimes, you know, preachers, we got too much time on our hands, you know, working that one day a week thing. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, when, when he rose from the dead, I, I wonder if he went to his brother James, and his brother James obviously came to faith in, in him because there's a whole book in the Bible about him, and, and, and same with his brother Jude, and I wonder if he went up to them guys after he rose from the dead and went, boom! Okay, kind of sick humor, but, you know, uh, kind of a funny thing, you know, to think about is, you know, when, when was it that they uh, uh, discovered who he was? And how did they discover? But we know that in the world, uh, sometimes those things are going to happen. Family members 
aren't always going to believe in Jesus Christ. And sometimes that's going to bring division in families. But the nice thing is, is we know that we need not wait to trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. We know the things that He did. We know the things that He said because they're written down. We even know the, uh, the stories of those who at first didn't believe in Him, but yet later came to faith in Him because they're included in the Bible. And so we have all these evidences, but yet we waste so much time. People waste so much time in their lives coming to know uh, uh, who God is and placing their trust in Jesus Christ. Why? Why do that? Well, you know, for some it's just stubbornness. For some, the reality just hasn't hit home. The Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Everyone will one day know who He is for truth. Not because I said so, but because He is going to come and reveal Himself to them. But unfortunately, for a lot of them, that time of decision is going to have passed. And they're not going to be able to have that opportunity. Why not make the decision now? Instead of spending a lot of years wasted or in regret, why not begin to serve God now in your life? And those years that, that would have been wasted will be so much more fulfilled. And at the end of life, you're going to be so much happier than you were without Him. And you're going to say, man, why did I waste all that time? I guarantee that's what's going to happen. So let's look at this other guy, Nicodemus. Uh, seems to me like he kind of wasted some time here. You know, we, we see uh, uh, a little bit more about Nicodemus later on in the book of John. Uh, after uh, Jesus was crucified on the cross, he came with a guy named Joseph of Arimathea and got his body down off the cross and took him and buried him in the tomb. But we don't know much more about his faith. He, he didn't have a very boisterous faith. He kind of stayed behind the scenes. I think he was afraid. I think he was a, 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 maybe a little bit ashamed. And I wonder if after Jesus rose from the dead, if it changed his life any. Well, we don't know because he's never mentioned again after that point of putting Jesus in the tomb. But we know that Nicodemus didn't speak out and say or do the things that he should have done. Instead, he kind of heme hauls around here. Well, doesn't our law say, you know, aren't we, you know, according to the law, you know, I, I don't want to say anything directly in support of this uh, Jesus guy, you know. But, but, you know, doesn't our law say that we're, you know, supposed to give him a fair hearing first? You know, and, and he's kind of heme-hawing around the subject because he's afraid. He's more worried about popular opinion than he is about uh, uh, Jesus and who he was and what God thinks about him. Same thing we saw earlier in the text. A lot of the people knew who he was, saw the things that he did, believed in him, but they didn't uh, want to speak up because they were afraid of the Jews. They were more afraid of the temple leaders than they were of what God thought about them. And a lot of people are like that in the world around them. I want to look at a few more texts here real quick at some of the division that it talks about in here. And the first one I think is in verse 12. Let me check my note here. Yep, verse 12. And I just want to show you these real quick. Among the crowds there was widespread whispering about him. And let me go over to that slide here for a second. You can follow along up here if you want. Uh, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him, and some said he's a good man. Later on in the verse, it said, no, he, he's a deceiver. Uh, jump over to uh, verse 30. At this, they tried to seize him, but nobody could lay a hand on him because uh, his time had not yet come. They hated him for that. But look at verse 31. Still many in the crowd believed in him and put their faith in him. Look at verse 32. It says, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent the temple guards to arrest him. So, you know, part of them uh, uh, believes in him. Part of them hates him. Part of them wants to kill him. They don't know what to do. As verse 43 said, we talked about that before. Thus the people were divided. They didn't know what to do. And that's what Jesus does. He brings division. E even amongst uh, believers sometimes, he brings this. This division that happens. All right? Let's move on. Verse uh, 45 to 47. He says, Finally the temple guards went back to the chief priest and asked him, and they asked him, uh, Why didn't you bring him in? And they said, Because we were blown away by his teaching. No one ever spoke the way that he did. They couldn't figure it out. 
You mean you've been deceived as well? There is this division again. Even the guys who are hired, these are hired guards, temple guards, and they're sent to arrest him by their bosses. And they come back to their boss, and, and the boss says, where is the guy that you were supposed to arrest? And they said, we are just blown away by him. And there's division again, even within uh, the, the Sanhedrin, even within the temple. Now there's more division going on. You see all this chaos that stirs around Jesus. You see? You think that Jesus came to bring peace and harmony and pink butterflies or something. You know, we all just get along. It's not the way it is. Because there is division between right and wrong, between good and evil. And it's an easy distinction to tell if you're paying attention to it. Okay? Those who have personal relationship with Him will know that He is the Son of God. Some people say He's one thing. Some people say He's another. Some people say He's um, a good teacher. We see the same thing in the world around us today. Some say, no, He was only a prophet. Uh, some, uh, uh, some say that He really was the Son of God, and hopefully that's you. Hopefully you know who He is and have a personal relationship with Him. Because if, if you don't, you're in a lot of trouble. Thus, it says, the people were divided. That's the same way it is today. You've got to be fully convinced in your own heart who He is. Remember, as I said a, a couple weeks ago, here I am, I'm saying it again. I think I, this is 34 times since we started the book of John that I've said this. You cannot drink the cup of Christ and the cup of demons at the same time. Paul said that in Corinthians. You can't live in the world and follow the way the world does things and follow the ways of God at the same time. It's not going to work. You're fooling yourself. If you think you're a Christian, but you can live any way you want, do anything you want, and, and uh, act any way you want, and that someday uh, God's going to come back and just make it all right. You know the right thing to do. You should. If you don't, guess what? It's in here. Okay? It's in here. Pick it up and read it for yourself. Now, uh, uh, something that happened this week in uh, Topeka, Kansas, they had this uh, kind of uh, uh, protest or parade thing or whatever it was, and, and they were protesting this law that had actually got voted down, so I'm not sure why they were really even protesting, but the law was, uh, they said, um, anti-gay or discriminatory against same-sex uh, relationships. And uh, so they, they had all these people come and they were protesting. And of course, the ACLU was there, which it sh shouldn't probably surprise anybody. But uh, uh, another gal came and she was from Kansas City. And I want to read you, I printed a little bit of this article and I want to read it to you today. And her name is, I'll just say it, Carol. I, I don't want to uh, say who she is. Um, it says, um, braving the cold was less important than showing her support for others. She says are being treated as second class citizens. She says she is a Christian and she is straight, but she doesn't believe people should be punished by society for who they are. I've read the Bible from front to back, and then I read it back again. And at no time did Jesus ever say, I hate the gays, she said. He said, love thy neighbor. You're right. Jesus never said that because the word never existed. The word gays never existed back in those days. And I don't use it today, and, and I don't call people that either. But it never existed. But the act of what uh, is being talked about here most certainly is spoken about in the Bible over and over again. And God is opposed to it, the same as He is all other sin. And, and I don't know what Bible she was reading, and it says she read it through and then back again. Maybe she had it upside down. Maybe she needs to turn it right side up. It seems pretty clear to me. I don't see where there's a big dis distinction problem. Uh, but and some people today get into this thing, and 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 I was going to lay this out because it's kind of tough, and and a lot of people uh, struggle with this. Um, you know, if it's not in the New Testament, we don't believe it. Well, I'm pretty sure that the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3:16 that all Scripture is breathed by God. Okay, what does that mean to you? That means that, um, as Paul said, uh, uh, this is kind of how it is, and, and, and I have a, a favorite rabbi I, I like to watch, and, and, and he made this distinction one day, and, 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 and I just loved it. You know, I thought it was really cool. And he said, you know, the New Testament is like the milk. You know how Paul talked about that? You know, and, and Hebrews 6, 1 says, what? Well, we've got to move on past the elementary teachings into the deep things of God. 
And the Old Testament is like the meat and potatoes. You know what I'm saying? It's the kind of stiff that sticks to your ribs. Nobody wants to study the Old Testament sometimes anymore because, you know, we see it as a, just a bunch of rules and regulations. But that's not who it is. And that's not what it is. That's not who God was. He's not just a, a, a guy that came to bring us a bunch of rules and regulations. He came to show us His love and how to separate ourselves from the world. That's what the whole Old Testament does. How to be holy. How to be set apart. doesn't mean we're better than anybody else. I'm not better than anybody. There's probably kids in this room that are ten times better than me. That's not what it means at all. But it gives us a clear distinction of how we should view the world and the things of the world and view a life in Jesus Christ. Now, I know that all this has sounded uh, so, so cheery so far uh, this morning, but let me tell you uh, that I believe there, there is hope and, and there's some good stuff coming. And, and uh, 1 John, if you want to turn over there, you can. 1 John uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 4 here just real quick. And this is the distinction that goes on. You know, if we believe that things that violate God's commands uh, or offend Him are okay to do because Jesus is a new Jesus. He's a jesus -y guy and He's just loving and forgiving and you can do whatever you want, live however you want. We are sadly mistaken. And you have been deceived by the Antichrist, by the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of the lawless one in the world today. Listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now already at work in the world. You dear children, verse 4, are from God and have overcome them because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. You ain't got to worry about being friends with the rest of the world because if you've got God on your side, you haven't got to worry about anybody else. God is all you need for life. I said a couple weeks ago, you know, Mountain Dew, uh, Code Red Mountain Dew and, a, and my Bible, that's all I need in life. Because it brings me closer to my Savior. It brings me closer to knowing who the God of the Bible is and what He wants from me in my life and what I can do to serve Him. I serve Him not because I have to, I get to. I get to do it. If you have Christ in His Word, you have enough. That's all you need. Realize you can overcome any obstacle that comes in front of you. There's nothing you've got to worry about what's going on. Jesus said it this way. He says, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and bring your cross to your shoulder and carry it every day. What does that mean? That means you've got to nail the sins that you carried in your past to the cross and then leave them for Jesus. Then take up your own cross the burdens that you're going to have to bear in your life, Jesus never promised it was going to be a, an easy life. He just didn't. But in the end, He said it was going to all be worth it. If you stick, stick it out. Don't give up partway through. A lot of times people uh, give up partway through. I, I like to sometimes kind of put the test to people and, and really challenge them in what they believe so that um, I can see what they're made of. I want to see what they're going to do. Are they going to quit? Are you going to give up? Or are they going to push on? Keep going. That's what He calls us to do. You can tell when Jesus, uh, it says in verse 38, begins to have an impact on people because streams of living water will flow from them. And their life will be forever changed. It's never going to be the same. This isn't like getting an eyedropper and squeezing a little water into it and dripping a drip out every once in a while. This is streams of living water. You know why? Uh, what the big difference is in the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee uh, that where Jesus is teaching here and the Dead Sea a little farther to the south? There's no outflow from the Dead Sea. So water comes in there, but it has nowhere to go. So it just backs up just like the Word of God does in your life. And if you're not letting it out, you're not sharing it with other people, you're not uh, uh, teaching truth in the world around you, you, you just get kind of stopped up and, and, and you die on the vine. And we're going to be talking about that in a few weeks of what happens. When Christians 
become ineffective in the world around them. What does God say is going to happen? Cut them off, throw them in the fire. It's not a fun place to be. Be active for God. The Word of God is active, and it should be active in you. Okay? Now, once upon a time, um, it, and I really love this story, and hopefully I can get through this analogy and make sense to you. Um, it, it, when the Holy Spirit, you know, fills you up, you, you know, uh, uh, two things are going to happen. Well, one is 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 you're going to have to let it out, and if you let it out, uh, uh, things are going to begin to change in the world around you, and people are going to hate you for who you are. They aren't going to like who you are. It's just the long and the short of it. Unless they're in Christ, they're not going to like you talking to them about what God said is right and wrong. People don't want to know that. They, I, I, I work, live in a world of relativism, okay? And whatever is relative to me is right and wrong. But that's contrary to the Word of God. See, and you can't have both. You can't live in both worlds. Oh, you can, but it's a fairy tale world. It's not a true world, okay? Jesus one time um, took uh, the, the guys to Caesarea Philippi. And he, he said, you know, when they got there, he said, who do people say that I am? He asked him this question. And at uh, Caesarea Philippi, the reason he took them there was because it was a big distinction between the things of God and the things of the world or the underworld or the evil world that was around them. And, and this is what it looks like. This is Caesarea Philippi. This is kind of an up-close shot. You can't see the whole uh, region here. But the reason he brought them here was very important. He wanted to make a distinction in their lives, and he wanted to ask them a question, a very important question. And one of the things that used to happen here at Caesarea Philippi is you see all these cutouts in the wall? Well, they used to place little statues in there, these little gods in there. The most prevalent one in this area was the god called Pan. P -A -N. Now, uh, people came from all over the place to worship him. It was also said that uh, uh, there's a cave. You know, if you were drawn back a little bit, you could see it. There's a cave entrance. It goes way down in there. And uh, um, they used to say well, that was the entrance uh, to hell. That was the gateway to hell. And, and that's kind of where Jesus made that statement. You know, that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Okay? You understand now why he said that and what, why he said it at this place? And it's very interesting because he brings those guys there because here was the distinction. Here was the Son of God standing in this unholy place. And he said, who do people say that I am? And then he turned to them and he said, who do you say that I am? Are you ready to make that distinction today? He says, you've got to know who you are in me. What he was asking, he's asking each and every one of us today, is who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Was he just a good guy to you? Was he just a good teacher, a good prophet? And if he was the Son of God, then we make, need to make sure that we're living our life accordingly. If that's what we believe, and if you don't believe it, you've got a problem in your relationship with God. He brings him here for a specific um, a distinction that he wants to make between the evil in the world and following God. And he was the Son of God. Now, interestingly enough, a, a couple days later, uh, he takes him up on a hillside. And uh, he takes him up to the top of this, uh, uh, and I call it a hillside because, you know, most of their mountains over there were 3,000, 4,000 feet, something like that, 3,500 feet. And, and, and yeah, I don't live on a mountain here, but I'm already higher than that. Uh, a, a, where we live here a, and uh, and so he takes him up on this mountain and it's overlooking this area of Caesarea Philippi and and uh, the distinction is this is that he asks him you know this question then he takes him up on this mountain now he does this for a reason in Matthew chapter 4 Jesus is led out into the desert and he's after uh, 40 days of fasting and praying and I can't even hardly make it three days fasting you know what I'm saying 40 days, I'd just be dead. I'd be laying on the ground. But, you know, I'm not, I don't have the strength that he does, obviously. Um, anyway, in Matthew chapter 4, Satan comes along after this 40-day period of time, and, and he um, uh, challenges Jesus, you know, and he puts him to three tests. And one of those tests is he takes him up on a high mountain. And he says to him, you know, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all that you can see 
all these kingdoms as far as you can see around you. He was trying to tempt him into giving up and choosing this earthly life and the world and the pleasures of the world versus a kingdom throne. And Jesus said, beat it, buddy. And he slayed him with the word of God. Pulled it out and slayed him. Now Jesus has come and he's brought his disciples up on a mountain so they may see the same distinction and make the same decision. Who do you say that I am? And on this mountaintop, you know, uh, Moses and Elijah up here. And Peter, you know, poor Peter, scared like Peter, cottontail rabbit or something. You know, he, he doesn't know what to say. And so he says to him, hey, you know, how about if I put up three pup tents for you? You know, three shelters. And, and remember the distinction there is that the, the feast of what? Tabernacles is coming. That's what we read back at the beginning. And so Peter doesn't know what else to say. And this voice uh, comes from heaven. And in Matthew 17, I, I'm just going to pop over there and, and I just want to read this to you real quick. Because I find it very interesting. Because um, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, something else we read out of the Old Testament. And, and there again, you know, here's that distinction. Uh, God fulfilling uh, His promise. And he said, it says in uh, uh, Matthew 17, excuse me, verse 5, While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to what he says. Listen to him. Moses said the same thing. He said, A prophet is going to arise one day from among your people, and you must do what he says. You must listen to him. God here is fulfilling that. And I wonder if at that moment those guys thought of that. And they thought of uh, uh, Moses' promise out of the Old Testament and how it was right that moment in front of their very eyes being fulfilled. Listen to him. Make the distinction. Make the decision. This is my son. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a, a, a guy to come along and bring a new philosophy or a new teaching. He was the son of God. And just as those guys had to do in that day, had to make a decision. Who am I? That's what Jesus asked him. Who am I? Who do you say that I am? We have the same decision we have to make today. In Joshua chapter 24, uh, verse 15, as we close today, I, I want you to think about this because I think it's very important um, be because Joshua challenges the people at the end of his life and he says, you've got to choose you this day whom you will serve. Who are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the world and the way that the world does things? Just go along to get along in the world? Or are you going to follow God? And Joshua says, here's my choice. You decide for yourself. I'm not making it for you. I'm not deciding for you. You've got to do it. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we each individually have to make that decision. It has to be personal. God is asking you right now, are you ready to make that distinction? Are you ready to set yourself as a follower of mine apart from the rest of the world and do things different than the rest of the world? You can't live in both. May you be at peace.